Good afternoon. I'm Lily Schrope, the Marketing and Communications Manager here at CPR. We are thrilled to have all of you with us for our annual meeting. If you are on LinkedIn or Twitter, please follow CPR there and also search for the hashtag CPRAM22 to connect with other meeting attendees and to share your thoughts about something new you learn or find surprising. I hope you all had a great break and are ready for an interesting afternoon. Our next panel will give us a glimpse into the future of online dispute resolution. The moderator is Colin Rule, the president and CEO of Mediate.com and Arbitration.com. He works at the intersection of conflict resolution and technology and was an early pioneer in online dispute resolution as a service provider. He is also currently a lecturer in law at the Stanford Law School and an author on the subject of online dispute resolution. Colin has brought together a fascinating group of panelists, which I will let him introduce. So over to you, Colin. Thank you so much, Lily. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for this panel on online dispute resolution and the future of technology and dispute management. Um, I think it's it's a little generous to me to say that I brought together this panel. I think these are some of my closest friends in the field and uh, experts. Um, I, I don't have long and ornate bios for all of them prepared, but I will say that they are the top experts in online dispute resolution. My good friend Ola Deji from Harvard, Amy, my close collaborator from the Mordet School of Law at, in Ohio, and Laura, the CEO of Immediation from Australia. So we've got a very rich panel planned for you today, talking about all of the things, uh, not only that are happening in ODR, but things that are happening kind of over the horizon. Now, I've been instructed that I have a CLE code that I need to share, but I have to wait until 40 minutes into the panel in order to share that code, that magic code. So please, uh, fellow panelists, don't let me forget to do that uh, when we get to the 40 minute level. So somebody send me a private message and then, I, and then I will do it. But one of the things we thought we might start out with is just a couple slides to kind of set the frame, if that's okay. So if you don't mind, let me indulge myself here in just a couple slides that I think will help to clarify what we're talking about. Okay, let me click the magic buttons here. All right, this is the challenge. Here we go. Okay, so hopefully somebody confirmed for me you're looking at a slide that says online dispute resolution platform examples. Okay, Looks victory. Good. Victory. So again, the first thing is, what is ODR? Just a level set for everybody in this session. Online dispute resolution is simply the use of information and communications technology to help people resolve their disputes. Now, we've been using this definition for the last 20 years, and I think it's been adequate because there hasn't really been that much use of technology in dispute resolution. But the pandemic has hit, and now everybody's using Zoom, and now we're starting to realize that this definition is getting a little long in the tooth. I think just by saying that it's technology plus ADR, we're actually not providing a lot of clarity around what are the different components of online dispute resolution. So we're starting to see a refinement in this definition. This is what the National Center for State Courts has defined online dispute resolution as being, quote, a public facing digital space in which parties can convene to resolve their dispute or case. And I think it's a great definition. I think this is a good Good definition for a lot of what we're doing out there in terms of bringing people together online and working out problems. But one of the things this definition leaves out is all the exciting things that are happening in the area of algorithmic ODR. So this definition doesn't encompass what we're going to talk about today in terms of blockchain and smart contracts and machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, or even just game theory based uh, ODR. So I think you know, this, this, the, it's a bit of a moving target in terms of what ODR is, but our aspiration for today is to talk talk about kind of what's happening now, and then maybe give a sense of where all of this is headed. Now, let me start out with uh, one of the top platforms in the world, and we're lucky enough to have Laura here uh, from, from, uh, from Immediation to tell us everything about how Immediation works. Um, but, uh, but, but Laura, you, you said you might even be willing to share a, a couple screens. Maybe you can show us a little bit kind of about how Immediation works. Are you, are you ready to do that now? Oh, sure thing. If you want to jump right into that. Yeah. Why don't we do that, if you don't mind? Um, and then I'll take back the conch in a minute. Can you? Do you have the share screen ability? I do. Great. Sure. So, um, Colin, I've just jumped right on into the platform as it appears to a user, uh, whether or not they are um, a neutral party, so an arbitrator, a mediator, or an administrator, or an indeed a lawyer in a law firm, um, everybody has an account on the platform which is uh, authenticated through multi-factor authentication to make it extremely secure. 
the list of matters that everybody has is visible only to them um, as a participant in that case. And so you can see that, you know, I've done a few demos in recent times, um, but your cases are live there and, and they exist for you to go in and out of um, as in when you need to. And so the key, I guess, differentiator there between this and what I what you've referred to as generic video conferencing or Zoom, that to me is not ODR. That to me is just a digital, you know, point and shoot video. Mm -hmm. ODR for me is taking it to a purpose-built solution where it's, you know, designed, crafted, facilitated for our use case, for lawyers, for judges, arbitrators and mediators, mediators to do their best work online. So it's taking it much more to a, a, um, a more refined level where we can do the work that we used to do in a physical space, but translating it online. So once the, the purpose of having all those matters there is that you can upload documents in advance, either as a neutral party or more particularly, for example, as one of the sides of the case. And you'll see here that um, on this homepage for the matter, that the attendees have been laid out uh, in legal party definition, uh, including in this case, only one plaintiff and defendant, but the platform recognizes multi-party cases too. And so that if you upload documents, they're shared only with your team to begin with um, through this documents tab. And then you can create uh, arbitral books, court books, position papers and files of documents for, for uploading. So it starts to take it well beyond you know, video um, into a different realm. We do, however, have completely integrated video um, in the platform. So I'm just gonna go into this now, which may be a little slow because it's screen sharing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go into the conference by myself because all my colleagues in Australia are, are asleep. My US colleagues are here at the conference um, in Chicago and walking around the floor. So I'm here on my own, but You'll see a lot of standard things about the video, um, which you'd be used to, for example, the ability to switch to presenter, audio or gallery, to pin people in an order of your choice, to screen share and chat. But then once you get past that, there are more complex things afoot. The documents that were uploaded, either during a document intake process, which we customise to our clients, or indeed on the fly, um, for example, Your Honour, I forgot to refer you, know, refer you to this case in my brief that I sent over to Chambers yesterday. Please, may I hand it to you? You can now do immediately through this. So those documents are there, visible to whomever has the permission, never a witness, for example. But we then get into things like the participants tab. So only the arbitrator, mediator or judge or the law firm in charge of a two-party negotiation has the ability to move people around. So I've just taken myself as an arbitrator to a bird's eye view of who is here and where they are. It's obviously only me, but I'm in the lobby. The plaintiff and the defendant have their own party rooms where they can go and discuss, can have contextual chat among their legal client teams and their own document share, as well as their own whiteboards, which is entirely private even from the arbitrator and he or she can never enter. But I can drag and drop by team or by individuals into the main room, into private rooms and so on. And so you see a lot of the work is actually done for you. You don't have to do a lot of heavy lifting as an arbitrator or mediator to run a case. Um, a whole lot of other things like complete control over audio, video, chat, screen share and document share of the participants, which we'll get to in a moment in relation to the question about control of the mediator. Uh, and then finally, a whole stack of drafting tools um, the most expansive of this, you'll see, it's a bit, sorry, I've got multiple screens open here, but I started drafting some preliminary orders inside the tool, which you can draft together so we can pass the pen from one person to another inside the platform and then sign and seal. So that's useful, obviously, for mediation as well as uh, arbitration. And in fact, a lot of litigators I show this to say, gee, it would be really good to show my corporate colleagues how to um, how to draft and sign deals inside a platform. So that's just a taste, um, Colin, of what we do. Um, that's great. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah. And uh, obviously, we could do a whole hour just looking at the, the power of the mediation platform. But I think Laura's point is well taken. We obviously are using Zoom nonstop 
in the dispute resolution field. But I, I like to say that Zoom is kind of the gateway drug to ODR. And I think once you start to realize the power of video plus some of these components Laura's talking about, I think, I think it's incredibly helpful. Let me, let me continue with my slides here. And uh, I want to get the, to the conversation as quickly as I can. Um, but I, I also want to mention, you know, uh, at, at mediate.com and arbitrate.com, we're launching our platform, odr.com, which I think is, it's, again, an online collaborative workspace where parties can come, together to, can come together to resolve their cases. But again, we take a slightly different angle than the mediation platform. So let me actually stop my share and just show two seconds of the way our system works. Um, the first thing about odr.com is all of our tools are highly embeddable. So we can go to any website and create essentially a filing process right on that website where um, a user can click on the link in a help system. They can go through a filing process and create a case. And when they finish that filing process, they're right back on the site or service where they started. And once that case is created, it comes into our platform that we call Case Load Manager. And this is an interface for administrators and case managers to come in and see all of the cases that are open on their server. Uh, they can see all of the calendar events that have been booked for all of their cases. They can see all of the activities that have been completed by their staff. They can click into each individual case and look at the details of this case and all the details in each case are completely configurable. And you can see the documents that have been uploaded. You can see the users involved with the case. But the reason why this is more interesting is because we also create these online meeting rooms for each individual case. And these are the places where the parties can come together. They can communicate back and forth. We have discussions essentially where you could, they could be mediator discussions with private conversations. They could be arbitration conversations where everything is done in a joint session. The mediator and arbitrator has the ability to pause the conversation at any time. For instance, you can draft your settlement documents right within the platform. Um, and the other beautiful thing about this is we have real-time reporting about all of these caseloads in real-time drawn out of the actual database that is using to that, that powers the case management system. So you can see at any point, you can get a bird's eye view of all of the statistics and metrics about your platform in real time. So this is just another example, again, of a different approach to ODR than in mediation. We don't have any video integrated into our platform. Uh, we have the ability to schedule in the calendar video conferences, but we could collaborate with a platform like in mediation to provide that functionality. So it's just a taste of two different platforms let me also go back to my slides here, and then we can sort of flip through some other examples. But these are just uh, two platforms that are being used at scale with uh, hundreds of different, of different clients to resolve cases online. Um, what we're seeing now is also the emergence of other techniques. Um, this was a company that I started, uh, spun out of eBay, and then we sold to a company called Tyler Technologies that's focused almost exclusively on the courts. So we've seen more than 85 courts in the United States deploy online dispute resolution for their civil caseloads. Most of them are focused on small claims, landlord tenant, debt collection, family type case volumes. But we're seeing the, the acceleration of ODR in the court context is very exciting, not only in the US, but around the world. I know there's a lot happening in Australia as well, but in China and in Europe, um, we're even seeing in countries like India, they're making online dispute resolution mandatory for all digital payments. So there's a lot that's happening in the public context as well. Um, and this is a platform that's out of the UK, Resolve Disputes Online. I I think that also takes a slightly different approach. Um, Modron is another Australian provider that's more focused on video. So we're seeing a real flowering of platforms. Uh, this one here, Resolver, actually they built a platform called Accord that's focused mainly on consumer cases. And a lot of online dispute resolution came out of e-commerce initially, but now we're seeing it grow beyond those low dollar value, high volume cases into other kinds of uh, volumes. And this is a platform, a new provider in, uh, in India. I think we've seen more than 13 ODR providers emerge in India in the last five years. So it's very exciting to see uh, what's happening in India. Obviously, a civil case in India, the average time from filing to resolution can be more than 10 years. So there's a real need for expedited online processes for resolution. Um, this platform is interesting because it's run by Profeco, which is the Consumer Protection Agency in Mexico. And it's a chat-based system for resolving disputes between consumers and like the water board or, or the electrical board board. They have a 96% resolution rate through this platform, which is very impressive. And then we have other 
platforms, and this gets a little bit more to what we're going to discuss in a few minutes. This is a platform called Kleros.io, and they actually provide crowdsourced juries for resolving disputes. They're very focused on uh, virtual currencies, sort of like Bitcoin and Ethereum and blockchain related disputes. But you can put together a jury of people from around the world who are all incentivized through these virtual currencies to provide good service in deciding cases. Whoever gets a majority of the jury to agree with them wins the case. And I think this platform, Jur.io, is also similar in that they provide these kind of crowdsourced platforms, but they also bring in more expert panels onto their jury. So, you know, there's a thin line between an arbitration panel and a jury. It might just be a question of scale. But these organizations are kind of looking over the horizon in that respect. Um, New Era ADR is making a big splash out of Chicago. Um, they're going to essentially corporations and building resolution systems at scale, um, largely consumer focused cases. I think they did a big deal with Ticketmaster. So um, they're sort of coming in on the low end of the market and using technology to provide uh, arbitration outcomes um, at scale. And then Fair Claims based out of LA, again, they're working with a lot of the tech companies uh, out here in Silicon Valley, providing sort of expedited online arbitration processes. So there's also, as I say, innovation around the world. Econciliador is happening in Brazil. They're doing automated negotiation of consumer cases. Um, where the, a business can put in a profile and essentially a consumer comes in and negotiates against the rules that were inserted by the business to resolve tens of thousands of disputes at scale. Uh, People Claim is, is, is an initiative in the Midwest that resolves disputes. They sort of advocate on behalf of consumers in e-commerce disputes. Um, and they've built an expedited process. You can even subscribe and pay them an annual amount and they'll resolve all of the disputes that you may encounter on any sites across the course of the year. Uh, this is a platform out of British Columbia, Smart Settle, which is incredibly cool, where two parties can log in. They can each provide essentially a model of the negotiation and their preferences in that negotiation. And Smart Settle will deliver a mathematically optimized resolution that delivers a Pareto optimal outcome that maximizes the benefit to each side based based on their expressed preferences. So this is an example of the way algorithms can help with dispute resolution. And then many of you know uh, CyberSettle, uh, which, which uh, handled a lot of cases in New York for many years, where it's a very simple game theory-based system where each side puts in three bids. And if any of the bids are within a certain specified resolution percentage, the case settles for the median and it's binding. So these are just examples of many of the different platforms that are going on out there. Grist for the mill, if you will, for our discussion. But why don't I why don't I open it up and uh, let, let's have a wider conversation with the panelists about some of the trends. Now that we have some examples of platforms out there, um, let me start with with uh, with Laura. Um, you know, because you you just showed us the mediation platform. You're spending a lot of time talking with general counsels and businesses as they look to put these systems together. What do you think? You know, thinking out, I don't know, two, five, ten years from now. What role do you think technology will play in convening and shaping these kinds of resolution dialogues? Thanks, Colin. Well, I mean, I think we're obviously in phase one or maybe um, maybe phase two of online dispute resolution as we now know it. Mm -hmm. The key word used there is convening. And so I think the market has clearly shifted to convening online and that's a brilliant step forward. Mm -hmm. um, phase two, in my view, is moving into purpose-built solutions because we don't want phase one to sort of fall over with, oh, that didn't really work. It wasn't a band, it was a band-aid. Our industry is way more sophisticated than that. So we'll revert back. Mm -hmm. That's not a good outcome for the environment or accessibility. So we I think we will, we are definitely seeing our clients starting to ask for, we want something more than Zoom. We don't really know what that thing is, but we want something right. good. And so we're starting to see the appetite um, for moving past the band-aid into proper, you know, um, design for lawyers, arbitrators, and mediators. And so I think we're in that phase at the moment of, okay, we, we now know we need to convene digitally. Great. What's coming on the horizon? And I think it's still too early for the market, but obviously the, con the conversation being driven by technology. Um, so, you know, for example, the tools you just mentioned, we have one too, an automated negotiation tool that algorithmically se selects um, an outcome for the parties and helps them move closer to bridge the gap. Uh -huh. um, the use of AI and more exciting even than AI, I think is, is data. The use, once we can start to collect in an ethical manner, we've been speaking to Amy about how, how we can do that ethically and starting to figure that out. But once we can collect in an ethical manner, sufficient data 
to be able to de-identify people's resolution factors mm -hmm. and then feed that back into the system to actually give people at the beginning of their dispute, this has a 60% chance of settling for this amount of money. You know, over this period of time, you are the plaintiff, therefore offer X, or you are the defendant, therefore accept Y. I think right. that that's where we will start to actually change the game. So we start to resolve disputes by reference to a data-driven approach. But I think, Colin, from what I know about the speed that this market moves, we're looking at at least five to 10 year time horizon. Could yep. be wrong. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I don't think we're ever going to unring the bell. We are never going to go back to the world the way it was in December 2019. I think those days are gone. And people say, well, once the pandemic ends, well, we'll get back to normal. But I think now we have a new normal. And I think you're right. I think Zoom is the new phone. You know, you say, well, I'll just Zoom you. Okay, everybody knows what that means. But let me come to Amy and Oladeji on this question too. I mean, how do you think, I think that the norms have changed an enormous amount. I mean, Amy, you and I've been doing this for mm -hmm, years. I mean, it's incredible to see, you know, the emergence of the iPhone, the emergence of social networking, the legitimization of digital channels as a way to resolve disputes. And I think that's only going to accelerate. But wh what do you think is going to happen over the next two to 10 years? How do you think dialogue and resolution is going to be is going to be changed by technology either you can can take it which i don't know if Oladay amy it's you to... you go all right all right well number one i think um one thing i've been working on personally is also um analyzing i have created charts where i'm analyzing all of the different um, odr providers out there all of the different court programs also looking at how AI has been developing within these programs mm -hmm. and then and then identifying the gaps and seeing where we need broader expansion. And so uh, building on what Laura had said, I mean, we're looking for more, it, you know, and, and a lot of individuals are not really sure, you know, what is it that we want? We know we want more than Zoom, but what exactly is that? And so coming up with an idea in a modular system where you do provide these different technologies, I think we're going to see huge growth. If you follow the money, so one thing I like to do is follow the legal tech fund and follow some of these um, sort of funding and seeing where the money is going, you, there's going to be many, much larger use of agreement technologies um, that allow for parties to more easily create their agreements in real time within a platform. I also think data analytics, um, more so than machine learning, but really data analytics will be um, hugely growing by leaps and bounds um, in the future. And, and we're gonna have to be careful and we'll talk about that later with respect to the ethics and the ethical issues that could arise. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and actually maybe Oladeji, I'll, I'll roll this to you, but also talk about, I mean, Laura, I think opened up this topic of, you know, sort of the algorithmic role. Like that wasn't something we had in the face-to-face -face world. We couldn't sit at a table across from the other party and have an algorithm go and give us a sense of what is the zone of potential agreement? What, what are resolutions that have, have been achieved in similar cases? You know, I, I think it was a very human-centered process and technology was very much on the margins. But now we're starting to see technology kind of take a place at the table. And I, and I, you know, I know in ODR, we call that quote unquote, the fourth party. So uh, l let's take both of these things together. You know, how is technology changing the way that people negotiate and resolve their disputes, but also this role of, the fourth party, what is that? What does that look like? You know, how, how do we have a greater role for algorithms in our dispute resolution processes? Absolutely. And, and those are really key questions. So if we think about building on what Amy and Laura shared earlier, when we think about how more and more people are becoming accustomed to living all of their lives or the majority of their lives in digital spaces, I think it's only natural that the legal technology begins to present more and more viability and optionality to the population that are really in seek of these digital spaces. Mm -hmm. So when we speak of the fourth party, uh, and I think it's a really important term to zoom in on, um, as you shared earlier, Colin, each of these ODR platforms are using technology in a different way and for different purposes. So the fourth party is just the technology that these ODR platforms are, are using. Um, and the reality is that the fourth party and recognizing the importance of the fourth party will be critical so that we have these, as Amy alluded to, ethical systems that are responsive to the needs and interests of disputing parties and the mediators. So 
the fourth party is kind of in the background, and yet it is also a separate entity that will, in my opinion, continue to play an increasing role because we see in our population with the way the dem age demographics are shifting, younger, younger people are accustomed to these online exclusive spaces. And so it's only a matter of time where more and more of these online spaces consume uh, in the legal environments the, the disputes that we're seeking to resolve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I think for the term fourth party was first coined by Ethan Katch in 2001 in the book he did with Janet Rifkin. He talked about the fourth party is going to become more prominent. Now, this was before we had iPhones. This was before we had machine learning at scale, natural language processing, all of that. But I think if anything, the prescience of that term, as you say, I think it's contributed to sort of a cultural evolution. You know, I think there were things that we now ask the fourth party, like technology, in terms of if we had a little robot sitting at the table with us in the mediation room, you know, why don't you take notes? Why don't you send reminders? Why don't you track the documents? Why don't you send out payment, you know, invoices? All of those things were comfortable shifting to the fourth party now. But to me, the real question is, what are we going to ask the fourth party to do in the coming years? You know, if we're thinking about this two to 10 year timeline, that's going to be a timeline through which we see quantum computing become more of a factor. We see bandwidth increase. We see, and all of that just makes the fourth party smarter. So it's not even so much about what technology can do today. It's mm -hmm. thinking about how is this going to change the field? And it's not just dispute resolution. Obviously, the legal field is changing medicine, entertainment, finance, all of these trends. The, the, the move of our society online is changing every industry. But I think narrowing down, thinking about in, in our field, what are these tools going to look like? That's that's very interesting, very exciting. Laura and Amy, do you have any thoughts about that, the fourth party? Uh, it's interesting, Colin, because what's running through my mind is if you don't know, I mean, we see a lot of technologists starting to play in this field and, and they don't even understand the ethical issues that they have. Well, firstly, they don't understand them, but secondly, they have no idea that they're even there. Right. So this idea of the fourth party being a technology or a technology provider is super interesting because we need to make sure that it, it doesn't um, sort of spiral out of control in that the lawyers, mediators and arbitrators have no way of getting back on track to their ethical obligations anymore because it's just the technology, the fourth party is, is sort of let loose. So that's something that I'm acutely aware of. And we had a, a law firm, a large law firm today say, what about if you're subpoenaed to provide information? And we can say things like, well, we never record mediation. We don't enable it and we delete the data. But it's going to be super important to make sure that the, the sets of protocols and controls are organised and so, thought through by groups like CPR um, so that the profession can continue to have confidence in the way that this rolls out, Colin, I think. 100%. You know, we had, an, we had an ICODER. We have a group called the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution. We had a meeting yesterday. And we heard a presentation from uh, Spinec Global, who's trying to put together an open governance layer for ODR and e-justice in Europe. And we were talking about how easy it is, even with the tools that you and I have demoed this morning, Laura. It's not that hard to imagine somebody building an unethical dispute, online dispute resolution platform. I mean, if, I, if you say, I know your platform has this, my platform has this too. Yes, give us this information and we'll protect it. We won't share it with the other parties. Well, what if on the back end, you know, if somebody slips you know, PayPal's you or gives you a Bitcoin, sure, here's the confidential information. So we have ethical standards and CPR has led the development of these standards for mediators and arbitrators and ADR, arbitral institutions, dispute resolution institutions. But now we need to have ethical guidelines for the platform designers themselves. And we have to have a way to do audits and test these platforms to ensure they live up. And once we get to the point, and Thomas asked this question too, you know, everybody talks about the digital mediator, the digital arbitrator, where we may have artificial intelligence or machine learning playing that role. Well, then it's all the more important for us to have those ethical standards and that auditing in place, because a lot of those AIs are going to be almost a black box, you know, to outside observers. So we better make sure that those ethical ethical components are built into the technology that we use. And we can't just be using stuff that's off the shelf. It's not designed for dispute resolution because it's not going to provide any guardrails in terms of the process. So Amy, did you have thoughts about that? Yeah. Cause so I might jump in right there. I know it's kind of jumping ahead to ethics, but yeah. So I've been the co-chair now for this has been going on for over three years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's with the American Bar Association, ICODER, which Colin already mentioned. 
and NCT NCTDR, which is the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution. And the three bodies together, um, we are working on creating ethical guardrails. And it's been a three year and a half year process and we continue to work on it um, for exactly this reason, right? And thinking ahead and sort of ethical by design and user centric focus. Um, and also really thinking deeply about data and data analytics and how that data is used and how it is preserved and privacy. And so there's a lot of different issues that have come up and it's become a really large scale project and trying to bring in stakeholders um, and making sure that everybody's voice is heard in the process. But, but as you mentioned, Colin, the problem is as well that you have different audiences, right? So, so what is considered quote unquote ethical for a designer might feel different from a user, from a mediator, from a party, and you really have to take all of these different aspects into account when you're creating um, ethical guardrails around these different technologies. And, and also you have to think about creativity and the fact that if you do create guardrails now, right, there are technologies out there that we haven't even thought of yet, right? And so you have to allow for creativity and allow for expansion and be ready for that sort of expansion. Um, you know, it's an excellent because, point. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't create static rules now um, because most certainly things are going to be different even a year from now, right? I mean, we may actually be resolving disputes in the metaverse <laughs> next year, right? So, I mean, these are some of the things that we really have to think about. But at the same time, I do think ethical by design and taking it into account at the very instance that you're creating these programs is absolutely essential. Yeah. yeah and, and uh, you know, I've been involved with a lot of these international organizations that are looking to create frameworks. I mean, I know APEC released an ODR framework for cross-border commercial disputes. Um, I know the ISO currently has an initiative right now setting standards for cross-border e-commerce resolutions. And exactly as you say, Amy, the challenge is these standards can sort of freeze in amber the way we think about the field today and not take into consideration all the stuff that's coming down the pike, you know, and you mentioned the metaverse. We can talk about that a little bit more. I, I I wanted to also come to you because I know, I think you, you wrote a, a, an award winning article from CPR a few years ago on the topic of smart contracts and, and blockchain. I think those technologies are intended to be trust technologies for the wider internet to ensure that when someone makes a commitment, they're held accountable for that commitment. So we don't have kind of the wild west internet where anybody can say whatever they want. You can engage with whatever, whatever, whatever un unethical behavior you want. And it's, it's very hard to hold someone to account. This notion of blockchain and smart contracts is sort of a way to make a, a sort of a code based foundation for that trust infrastructure. So I don't know if you wanted to speak to that. I mean, you're, you're the expert on, on this panel wow. in terms of how that operates. Wow. So first of all, you wrote that article with me, my friend. Right? I, I will admit that I wrote Amy's coattails, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not ashamed about that. Yeah. So, but I think these are um, really interesting developments, and it goes back to this whole conversation where technology becomes the fourth party or the fifth party or more, right? Um, and these new technologies that you would have never imagined. In fact, just yesterday, it's a little bit perfect that this is coming up because it came up in my arbitration class and I was talking about these blockchain-based arbitration bodies, um, Claros, Jure, other companies that are out there and are using blockchain-based arbitration. And when I described the process to students, you know, their mouths are like wide open, but they're so excited about this idea. And, and it is about trust, right? It's what do you trust? Um, it's this idea of, you know, are you a crypto economist? So in simple terms, what does this mean? What we're talking about is, for example, Claros. With Claros, what happens is you are literally judged by a jury of your peers, which are other crypto, they're holders of this particular cryptocurrency where they can use it. Essentially, it's a utility currency that they use in order to vote. And what happens is, let's say that we have a dispute and we present our documents on a platform that we say, you know, one example um, that it is used, um, Claros is used for, is um, disputing whether or not a particular cryptocurrency is fraudulent or legitimate and whether it should be listed on one of these well-respected um, crypto ex exchanges. And so you could have a dispute about that, right? Party A, party B, they put forth their documents. And then all these token holders, this crypto, these tokens will vote for the party that they think ought, will likely win, okay? And so it's really focused not on so much who you think is right, but who you think will win. Why? Because if more 
if the majority of the if the greatest um, amount of jurors vote for the party that you voted for, then you actually earn additional tokens because you get the tokens of the people who voted for the loser, right? And so the idea is game theory, right? And so it's a game theoretic model. And in a lot of for plenty of individuals who are involved in this, they trust that more than they would trust an individual arbitrator or going to some individual judge because they trust the math. They trust the math and the, the, the way that this is built. And again, there's different ideas about this crypto economist and, and the ways that you can build it to build trust. And it really does come down to trust though. And so I argue in these different situations, we have to think about context, right? So it doesn't make sense for every kind of dispute, um, but it might make sense for, for example, disputing particular cryptocurrencies and whether or not they should be listed on an exchange because it's other crypto holders who believe in the math, who believe in the process. But, but it's really creating interesting questions about what is, for example, arbitration and how technology can really create a whole new reimagined way to um, resolve disputes. Right, and I think this is a, a key component of Kleros's messages. If you look at the CEO, Federico, he's written a lot about what he calls decentralized justice. And I think decentralized justice is kind of parallel to what they call decentralized finance. So obviously there's a lot of talk these days about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin and all of that. Um, you know, there are a lot of people working hard to build an alternate finance system that's not dependent on nation states, you know, printing currency. It's not dependent on central banks. Anybody can buy a Bitcoin anywhere in the world. And as you say, it's not governed by law. It's not really governed by the coercive power of nation states and judges and juries. It's more governed by code. And it's like Larry Lessig wrote about, you know, code is the new law. And if you could, if you opt into this framework, then you're transacting in an environment where you can't, you can't change the rules and everybody's audited the system. They know how the system operates. So decentralized justice is a parallel concept in that we can, we can resolve disputes. We can create smart contracts that are not paper contracts with wedding signatures on the bottom. They're little bits of computer code. And if Amy and I write a smart contract together, we can both sort of e-sign it and then put it into the blockchain so it can't be altered and it's self-administering. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter what law the, the contract right. is written under. The code is self-enforcing. And, and we, and, and because if, if conditions change and a provision in the contract is triggered, the money moves automatically. So this notion of the future of justice, again, if we're thinking out 5, 10, 15 years, this is a vision of justice that uh, it takes Lex Mercatoria to the next level. You know, there's no there's no jurisdiction. There's no site, a seat of the arbitration. There's no need to, you know, file a case in a court to try and get an outcome in force because it's all automatic and it's all built into the software itself. And it's I think this is, a, this is a pretty. Oh, yeah, please, Laura. No, please. I was just going to say it's pretty extraordinary to think that with all of our years of contract drafting, you know, among us all, um, that a contract could be drafted so tightly that it's entirely objective. Mm -hmm. that you could result in a trigger like that that's automatic with no room for dispute. I, okay. I find it very hard to believe unless it's a mathematical trigger by reference to some independent objective measure. I completely how agree. How on earth are we going to get oh, yeah. to that? <laughs> yeah, A great I mean, deal of our article is actually about how it actually will create new and different disputes. And, and Ethan Katz has talked about that um, extensively, how you know technology can actually create um, a lot of new disputes that we never even imagined. Um, you know, in fact, there's different ways of, even with computer code, you can disagree about how it should be interpreted, right? And so there right. can be some real issues there. But, the, know, but the thing is, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just want to make, uh, no, please, what were we going to say, Amy? Oh, no, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say exactly as you say, computers are going to generate many more disputes than they resolve. But I think this whole notion of, um, uh, um, I've lost my I lost my train of thought. I lost my oh, train of thought. I'll I come can, back to it. Ola Deji, please. I can jump in there to. because yeah. I think Clearos and blockchain-based ODR is another example of how technology can inform the ethics of any ODR platform rather than ethics restricting or narrowing what a technology platform can do. Because if you are a disputant in a blockchain-based system and you trust game theory you trust the crypto economics driving 
a blockchain-based ODR platform, then all of a sudden, it's hard to argue that that is unethical when the disputants are opting for that system and they place their trust in that system. But historically, the ethics have been framed where the users and the, and the disputing parties are less of the stakeholders in, in being considered. And it's more about the arbitrators and, and the mediators and what they are allowed to do. Because Clearos, you have arbitrators or juries, uh, jury members who are incentivized to reach a result, right? It, based on the outcome of the results. So voting with the majority all of a sudden brings this financial incentive that is hard to see in historical examples of arbitration, but it's the disputants who trust those protocols, who trust that system that are more or less informing how that system is being designed. But it seems to me that they're actually informing the outcome that they want rather than the outcome that, you know, that a judge has curated for them to choose between, you know, a set of facts that they have to decide. It's, it's not really a jury at all. It's actually more what is the will of the people and how they want this system to move forward. Because the way that Amy described it, you know, should it or should it not be fraudulent or legitimate, that's really the decision that they're making rather than one based on objective fact finding from what I'm understanding. No, I think that's absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, a good friend of ours, Jan Martinez at Stanford Law School, she's written a book on dispute systems design. And one of the things she talks about in the book is different conceptions of justice. Um, and I think Ola Deji, this is exactly along the lines of your point. If, if we can agree on the process that we're going to use to resolve a case, that doesn't guarantee us a particular outcome. But if, if you and I agree we're going to write a smart, smart contract and put it on the Ethereum blockchain and we're going to abide by that, that process, it may be that we trust that more over time. And this, I remember the point that I wanted to make, Laura, it was raised by what you were saying in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, we need to build justice systems that work the way the internet works. And the justice system that we have now is, is highly correlated to geography. It's highly correlated, you know, where is, it, where is the dispute located? And on the internet, that doesn't really make that much sense. So I think online dispute resolution gives us the flexibility to build new justice processes that work the way the internet works, where we don't have to worry about jurisdiction and we can build resolutions ex directly into the environments where the disputes arise in the first place. And that gets to the point that Oladeji is making, which is the parties should own the resolution process. Right. And if we can agree that we want to use this new process, this decentralized process, it doesn't mean that it's going to fully displace the legacy process. But if it becomes a more attractive option based on the kinds of transactions we're engaged in and the world that we're living in, I think people will make the proactive choice to use these solutions. And we're going to have to have resolutions built into these smart contracts because people bring disputes with them wherever they go, regardless of whether or not it's online or offline. So that's why we need to build this new decentralized model for working these things out. I mean, ultimately, Colin, it's still a foundation of contract law that you're relying on because without the contract, I mean, I understand what you're saying about the blockchain, but ultimately, um, unless you can have that wholly independent objective trigger, which will, which should mean there are no disputes, mm -hmm. then you're underneath that, you're still, the, the foundational theory of contract law must remain. And there's an interesting point that's been made in the chat, which is they're deciding what the law is by Janice. Well, as far as I'm aware, they still can't do that. Um, yeah. It's going to be a scary scenario if we're starting to take lawmaking out of the judicial and legislative branches of parliament. So, I mean, that's a whole other, a whole other ball game. There is. There is. We're, we're reshuffling the whole system here if we take the nation state out of the justice process. But I think, again, we're talking 10, 15, 20 years out. Um, and, and actually, there was another question I wanted to ask you, Odeji. You know, every time I do these presentations, I have lawyers post messages like, you know, am I going to lose my job? You know, is AI going to come and replace me? Or are we going to have digital mediators and digital arbitrators? You know, what, what's your sense of where all of this AI machine learning stuff is headed? Yeah, I, th I think that's the million dollar question. You could even say it's a billion dollar question in, in having AI transform or impact in a more coherent way than, than the limited purpose AI has been currently. Um, and for me, I think I've written about this. We should focus on the comparative advantage currently of what AI has relative to humans when we're predicting the future role of AI. And, and currently what we see AI's comparative advantages is with um, analyzing large swaths of data that humans could take a lifetime to analyze and spotting trends based off of that data. 
that humans, once again, could take a lifetime to spot those trends. So in my opinion, I think that AI will have a collaborative relationship with the legal industry. If you are a first year associate at a major law firm, instead of spending days, weeks, months analyzing court documents and doing doc review, you can have AI come in to analyze that data in a much quicker and efficient way. Uh While with that said, you still need the emotional intelligence of a human being and the creativity of a human being. So that's where the human uh, comparative advantage is, the creativity and the emotional intelligence. And I think we're going to continue to see skill collaboration between AI and humans rather than job replacement per se, Mm -hmm. where where humans are losing out to AI, because you need the human to supervise these systems. And we can get into the, 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 the justice protocols that are being put in place to govern artificial intelligence as well. You know, uh, I just got a reminder from my friend Elena, I need to give the code for the CLE. So here we go. This is the sixth code in your CLE series. And the code is future. F-U-T-U-R-E. Did I spell future right? I think I did. Future is the code. That's the sixth code in your series. So I feel like I'm a radio disc jockey. Insert that and maybe you'll win the the grand prize, but but Oli, your point is very well taken, and and I want to go to Laura about this too. I think there is an element of the human component of the dispute resolution process, and you know, Amy and I have a friend, Jean Sternlight, at the Saltman Center, who's written about the psychology of the justice journey and getting to resolution. You can't just have a computer program that takes all the data in and spits out a piece of paper that says, "Here's your resolution." You have to actually go through the process of feeling like you have ownership over that, and a lot of that we know, mediators know, that's about being heard. And computers can't give you that sense of being heard. You can type whatever you want into a form. If you click a button and it just goes into a database somewhere, you don't have that feeling. But maybe this crowdsourced approach even gives you the ability, instead of just having you know, three or five arbitrators hear it, you could have a thousand people potentially hear and listen to your arguments and then weigh in on what they think the appropriate outcome should be. I think the third party, the reason why I like the fourth party as a description of the role of technology is because it emphasizes there's still a third party. And the third party and the fourth party need to partner with each other. We need to figure out what humans are good at, what the technology is good at. And that's a changing thing because their technology is getting smarter all the time. But if we can shift all of our administrative responsibilities onto the fourth party, that means we can focus on the parts that humans really have to engage with. And Laura, I know you you thought a lot about kind of how you manage emotions and cultural differences in, in online processes. It can be harder to do when we don't have all these nonverbals. But it seems to me that's something the third party is best at handling. Well, I guess there's two components to that, Colin. I mean, with our workflows where we're taking claimants and defendants through highly specific targeted questions and answers and then using resolution-focused language to put that point to the other side and ask them for their opinion, I think you probably can get a degree of being heard even with a computer asynchronously that is potentially quite healthy because instead of getting, you know, the letter we've all received from the other litigation law firm, which ends with, you know, I'll see you in court. Thanks very much. Um, (laughs) Yours sincerely. You're not having that. You're having a much more constructive dialogue. Are you open to resolution? So I think you can get a long way in the correspondence piece. But in terms of, you know, how your mediators and arbitrators manage, short answer for that is the same way they always did. Uh And I actually wrote a paper on the psychology of trust in online dispute resolution and the fact that we presume that because there's a computer in front of us, it's not the same, that we're not um, eyeballing people, that we're not able to see the whites of their eyes. It's actually a massive presumption that we have as humans. Uh Um, There is certainly something to be said for being in the room with somebody because of all the pheromones and the other things that take place, which has nothing to do with sight. It's the other senses that we're missing. Uh Um, So that does need to be managed. But, you know, by and large, we know that the accessibility and environmental benefits of, benefits of online dispute resolution probably outweigh the incremental advantage of, you know, the, the, the hormones of your limbic system being engaged. Right. Um, but having said all of that, we do at a mediation pride ourselves on giving the mediator and arbitrator the best replica that they can have of um, being able to control what somebody says, being able to treat them in the way that they would in, the, in real life by trying to make the platform have as many tools in the toolkit as possible, but only they can use it because you obviously can't have 
the plaintiff and defendant shutting each other down. You can't have the plaintiff and defendant changing each other's screen share, but you right. can make sure that the part, the plaintiff and the defendant do not use text chat, mm -hmm. for example, to avoid intimidation. So I think it's all these little nuances in the design that will probably help the third party on their digital journey. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, they're going to have to have a whole new skill set for how to deliver, as we all have in the legal e ecosystem, how to deliver over video in a way that's compelling and engaging. And the best mediators in the world are doing that right now and picking it up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting for me too. I mean, having done this work for 20 years, I've had so many mediators, just giants, people I respect in commercial mediation, commercial arbitration say to me, this has to happen face to face. You cannot do this online. It is just, it's not possible. You have to read the body language. You have to be there. And then the pandemic hits, everyone's forced to go online. You see all the major arbitral institutions done thousands of cases online. And now I have these same neutrals coming back to me and saying, I love online. I, you know, this is better. You know, the parties can be, we don't have to travel all over the place, you know, especially if your only option is getting together face to face with a mask and, you know, six feet, you know, distant. I think most mediators that have had that experience, like, no, that's not nearly as good as Zoom when you can actually see the faces. And there are a lot of sand traps, obviously, um, challenges in, in doing things online, as you mentioned, you know, where there could be somebody in the other side of the camera you know, coaching the, the person in the process, or there could be somebody sending threatening text messages. You know, um, you, we can build the most secure ODR platform in the world with a thousand passwords and codes and everything. Somebody can still pull out their phone and take a picture of the screen or hit record and set it next to their speaker. So what we have to do, I think this is a training challenge fundamentally. And obviously CPR as the think tank for, you know, commercial ADR is thinking through what skills do we need to empower the next generation of mediators and arbitrators? What, what tools do we need to put in the toolbox so that they can, can navigate this new world? And I think that uh, you know part of that is dealing with emotions. Part of that is dealing with cultural differences. But Amy, this gets back to what you were talking about earlier too, about ethics. I mean, there are, there are a lot of dilemmas, practice dilemmas that online practitioners have to confront. And if you don't think these things through on the front end, you can paint yourself into a corner in your process where you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, we've even talked, I mean, Amy's the person that coined the term OARB. She invented that online arbitration back in the day. But this whole notion of running an effective online arbitration process, if you don't do it right, there's even a risk that you're your, uh, your decision could be invalidated down the road because it's like, well, look, you didn't respect the privacy. I didn't feel comfortable sharing the information. So, you know, I, my, my witnesses weren't able to participate because the video conference was badly managed. So, a Amy, what, what do you think about all that from a training, you know, how to train neutrals in order to practice ethically? in the new Oh, yeah, there's so much there. And I do want to just kind of on another note, though, back up a little bit in that you know, I think about, because yeah, we've been doing this for a very, very long time, looking at technology and, and in fact, the ORB thing, I think I wrote about that like 15 years ago or so. Um, and now, of course, it's become the norm. But I think I just want to make sure that we also acknowledge, we, we do have to sort of pause and realize, you know, I well, in ADR, we talk about fitting the forum to the fuss. And I argue you also have to fit the tech to the fuss, right? And so I don't think that all cases are appropriate for ODR in certain circumstances. So I do think we need to be very um, intentional and think that through also having helpers available. Um, I did my own research and one of the big things um, that I learned in surveying individuals about ODR is, you know, they'll try it, but they wanna be sure that there's someone available who can help them in real time. And especially if you're talking about the digital divide, mm -hmm. age tends to be a big issue. So I just wanna make sure we also are aware that, you know, we have to make sure to fit the tech to the bus and be intentional and ethical in that move. Um, but to your point, Colin, on training. So number one, what's really been kind of amazing, CPR included, many, 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 many bodies have put forth protocols on how to conduct virtual arbitrations and mediations. And in fact, being the complete nerd that I am, I created a chart <laughs> and you can all access it because it's free. Um, so it's on SSRN and I think it's also on arbitrate.com. And it's a chart of all of these various um, protocols that have, that have come about. And I think it's very instructional because you see how they coalesce around similar themes and similar really ethical um, choices that need to be made if you are going to, for example, conduct an online arbitration. Um, and training is so key because it's not as easy as just, you know, jumping on Zoom 
or, um, or jumping on um, Google Hangouts or something um, and conducting an arbitration. Instead, there's a lot of different steps in the process and thinking through how you're going to make sure that you validate documents. How do you make sure that there's not someone in the room coaching that individual? How do you deal with differential power? And especially if one party is very, very savvy with technology and the other one isn't, right? How do you deal with the situation where one party is on a phone because they don't have a computer at home and the other is on a beautiful, wonderful laptop with dual monitors? right? And a docking station and a great camera. So you really have to take into account these issues when you deal with online arbitration and online mediation. The same questions are going to come into play when you deal with these problems. And they really do. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's so many in training, Colin, you're right. Training, you know, it's not enough that you've been to an in-person arbitration training. You really need training on virtual arbitration. And I think a good place to start though is to go ahead and read these various protocols because there's a lot of them out there. It's really pretty cool how they've coalesced around different ideas. Uh, and I think that it can really help a person to be aware and think about the different issues, ethical issues that could come up in an online. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I'm certain that uh, CPR is going to continue to be on the bleeding edge of all of this because we all need to work together to solve, answer these questions. I do want to point to one of the things that Janice said in the chat is that she was saying that maybe the use of technology is very appropriate for cases in which the emotions are high. And I think the interesting thing is there's a bit of a generational divide in terms of comfort with technology. We now have a younger generation that have just gone through two years where literally all of their interactions were via technology due to the pandemic. I think there's going to be decades of, of ramifications from that period. And studies have shown that parties prefer to use online interaction for some of these difficult conversations around negotiations and mediation. So not only it's, it's technology changing the behavior of mediators and changing the mediation process, it's also if we look, listen to our parties and we use a user-centric approach, you know, we, we have a huge uh, drop in the number of default judgments uh, in online hearings versus court processes because people are much more willing to participate online. And the satisfaction numbers and preference numbers are off the charts in favor of online due to convenience, due to taking time off of work. So I think that there's a norm change. I think the culture is changing, and I think we need to embrace all of that. Ola Deji, did you have something that you wanted to say about all of this? Many wise thoughts. Um, I maybe just wanted to zoom in on some of the ethical challenges that still exist with in-person interactions. And, you know, imagine being a mediator and one of the mediating parties has spent two hours in traffic to get to the mediator's room and had to sacrifice income they're being paid hourly and had to sacrifice income to spend time with the mediator and had to find someone to take care of their children while they were with the mediator. And I, I think it's so I, I think it's really important to consider how the current in-person system, although beneficial to some, is, is still um, missing some of the benefits that many parts of our society are actively seeking out the flexibility that technology brings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. And to Amy's point about, you know, disparity of power, I mean, technology is the level here. There has always been disparity of power in litigation and dispute resolution. That's the problem that, as I see it, that you have um, defendants with heaps of money and all the resources that they need and often claimants who don't. So the fact that most people have an iPhone, most people have a computer or at least access to some form of tech and can get there um, uh -huh. means that we're actually bridging the gap much, much more, I think, than the flip side. Although there are, of course, some instances where, you know, Amy's right that the arbitrators will have to take that into account. But overall, overall, it's definitely a leveler of yeah. the, in every possible way. Well, and Richard Susskind, uh, in his recent book, Online Courts in the Future of Justice, he observed that 50% of people in the world don't have meaningful access to a justice system. So if you insist on face-to-face -face interaction, you're never going to move the dial. Maybe oh, yeah. you can bump that two, three, four percent But if you can make the courtroom of the future, the access to justice goes through a mobile device, and the cost mm -hmm. of those devices is getting cheaper and cheaper around the world, that may be an opportunity for us to have a step function increase in access to justice through some of these new models. So 
you know, I think it's worth it for us to think creatively about this. Yes, there are going to be challenges with these new with these new choices, these new dilemmas we have to face. But I think the opportunities outweigh the challenges. I really do. And I think we're going to civilize these tools over time and figure out how to use them to achieve the objectives we share in the field. And Amy, I would just add, I, yeah, I just I I definitely agree with Laura and I agree with it being a new um, really democratizing access to justice when it's mobile friendly. Um, being mobile friendly is absolutely vital if you want to help access to justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that's an important point that we need to think about when we're designing these different programs. Absolutely. And, I mean, on, on that, Amy, one thing that we were asked to build for the Children's Court in Australia is actually a dial out because some of the poor parents can't afford the phone call. So our platform can actually dial out by way of a call over to someone's mobile so they can participate without even having to pay. So there are those kind of things that you have to take into account, but at least having a tool or access to a tool in a common area where you can go and at least have that is pretty critical. Absolutely, absolutely. I could go on another hour, maybe another two hours. We could do a whole conference on this, but I do note that we are at time. I wanna thank very much my fellow panelists and friends. Thank you for this great conversation. Uh, I'm sure we will continue to have it. I also want to thank the excellent audience. Tom, I feel like you should get co-presenter status for all the great things you put in the chat. But um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, CPR, for giving us the opportunity to do this session and have a great rest of the conference and be well. Thank you.